So the phylum chordata, the phylum to which we ourselves belong, has both invertebrate and vertebrate representatives. The marine vertebrates are divided into four groups, fishes, reptiles such as sea snakes and turtles, birds and mammals. By far the most successful of the vertebrates, with more species than all the other vertebrate categories combined, are the fishes. I, I think people who look at evolution don't think in terms of up or down. Things are more advanced or less, but on a continuum of, uh, of sort of advanced characters, then uh, fishes are uh, quite along the way toward some of the most advanced uh, organisms. And the very primitive ones, there are very few left. The fishes without jaws, for instance, hagfishes and, and lampreys. So what we see primarily now are the result of hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And, and fishes have some just exquisite uh, adaptations to the environment they live in. Generally considered the most advanced, the bony fishes, the uh, osteichthys, which include most of the fishes that we think of as fishes. If you think of a fish, you think of a swordfish, or you think of a sunfish, or you think of a trout. That group of animals uh, are considered the most advanced. Two features of water, viscosity and density, make life for a fish a bit more difficult than if they were terrestrial or lived in an aerial or atmospheric environment. Fishes to swim through viscous, dense water, and salt is even more dense than fresh water, have to push themselves through molecules that are very dense and viscous. Therefore, there's a lot of um, friction drag. So fishes that need to move fast have evolved lots of adaptations, such as streamlining length, um, flexible caudal fins or tail fins, high aspect ratios, which would be sim similar to a wingspan on a, on a plane, but in the vertical way um, with a fish tail, um, scales, mucus, various things that make them more adapted to fast swimming. Now, the diversity of fishes is extremely high, ranging up to and probably higher than 25,000 species in the world's oceans, including freshwater for that matter. And in those environments, the diversity of different locomotory um, adaptations or anatomies is extremely broad. So you have trunk fishes that just hover and don't move anywhere. You have sculpins that live on the bottom near the rocky intertidal zone and don't move. You have flat fishes that do the same, but then you have tunas and billfishes and sharks and fast swimming things like small anchovies and sardines. And for some fishes, for instance, the, the great pelagic fishes, the tunas and the billfishes, they have to move all the time. So how are they going to do that without expending huge amounts of energy? Because really in evolution, that's the key. How do you do what you want to do expending the least amount of energy? And, and there's huge selective pressure to do that, to be as efficient as possible. So how do, how do fishes do things most efficiently dealing with this very difficult medium? Well, the first thing is, for, for those fishes that have to move a lot, you can reduce the amount of friction on your body. You can cut down the size of your scales. Scales stick out and produce a lot of friction. They're fishes that have no scales. They've taken it all the way down there. You can have your fins, which stick out and produce friction, tucked down into little folds. If you look at a tuna, when it's swimming fast, it's the fins on its sides, the pectoral fins, fit really neatly into little grooves so that it's smooth along the sides of its body. Now, some animals stay near the surface just by swimming all the time, but that takes a lot of energy. And you have to be a very specific kind of fish to do that. Most fishes, when they want to stay above the bottom, they use a swim bladder. Swim bladders, think of them as big balloons inside of your body. Having that little balloon of, of gas allows you to do is to regulate your buoyancy. And many fishes are very good at that to the point where they will put just the amount of gas into their bodies that will allow them to be neutrally buoyant so that they neither rise nor sink. Swimming and maintaining level in the water column allow fishes to travel long distances to locate mates, to eat, and avoid being eaten. As a group, much of their success depends on their finely tuned senses. There's no light down there yet most of the deep sea fish have eyes. What are they using their eyes for? Most of the things in the deep sea make their own light, and that's called bioluminescence. They have the ability to make their own light. And a lot of these fish are using that light to find food. 
They're using that light to find each other, to find mates in the deep sea. They're using that light to communicate with each other, to scare each other off, to get rid of predators. One of the important things to talk about when discussing how fishes survive in the ocean is their sensory mechanisms. Vision comes to mind, um, smell or chemoreception comes to mind. But fishes have a fairly unique uh, system called a lateral line system, which is a series of pores and canals along the body and sometimes on the head that allow them to pick up movements of water either from prey or even from just currents. Sharks generally have highly developed sensory systems. They also have an undeservedly bad reputation. More than 80% of shark species are less than two meters long, and only a few of the remaining 20% are aggressive toward humans. The largest sharks are among the least dangerous to humans. Reaching lengths of 18 meters, 60 feet, immense warm water whale sharks cruise the ocean surface, feeding on plankton and small fishes.